Welcome, I'm Richard Shinas. I'm the Dean of the Dietrich College of Humanities and Social Sciences. It's a pleasure to open the year uh, celebrating Marx's 200th birthday. So first, thanks to Kathy Newman and David Shumway for initiating and organizing this event uh, and for all the events that will follow year long. Uh, and thanks to Jolanta Lyon, the irrepressible force behind the Carnegie Mellon International Film Festival, uh, which will present the premiere of the young Karl Marx later this evening. And thanks to all the staff who work behind the scenes to make this event possible, like our good AV technician right in front of us. So I grew up in the 1960s uh, in a household with open-minded, progressive New York parents. But for most of my early years, Karl Marx was only known to me as the author of communism, a political idea I knew practically nothing about, but which I nevertheless attached to Joseph Stalin, the Prague Spring, the Iron Curtain, and the horror that was the Cultural Revolution in China. Uh, Anti-communist propaganda was powerful stuff in the 1960s, and I was predictably a product of it. Nothing in my high school education probed even slightly beneath the surface of an incredibly superficial view of Marx or Marxism. And regrettably little has changed in what I take to be the basic American cultural view of Karl Marx since then. So when I took a course in college in 1975 on modern political and economic thought, I was caught completely by surprise when I actually read the great man and some of his followers. Not only was I struck by the nuanced depth and sheer novelty of the arguments, but also by the weird optimism of it all. Quite explicitly, Marx argued that we were all being propelled to a weird future where everyone really took the idea of sharing everything super seriously. And maybe the reality of communist countries in the 20th century didn't live up to Marx's vision or even approximate it, but it was an incredibly optimistic vision nonetheless. For a different class I was taking at the same time, I was reading Emil Zola's masterpiece Germinal, the gripping story of French coal miners unfathomably abused by unfettered capitalism. The combination opened my eyes and made me wonder why <coughs> Marx had gotten such a bad rep and capitalism such a good one. Well, in retrospect, I should have easily figured that out, but what lasts for me in the experience is the importance of institutions like ours and the freedom they enjoy in creating opportunities for all of us to get beyond the propaganda that every citizen of every culture is bathed in from birth. So the Academy must take seriously its role in playing host to a wide range of political perspectives. We can't be unwilling to celebrate Marx, even though it might be anathema to those who control the current political landscape. And we can't be dismissive of conservative thought, even though it might be anathema to those who control the current academic landscape. So I was delighted when Kathy Newman came to me and said she wanted to devote a year or more of her life to a series of scholarly events to celebrate the 200th birthday of Karl Marx. Her excitement was palpable, and being able to support enthusiasm like hers is one of the fun parts of being dean. So again, I'm proud to help Kathy, David, and all of you who have worked on the celebration of Karl Marx at 200 and creating a great year of events. Thanks so much for doing it. So now let me introduce Kathy and David. David Shumway is a professor of English at Carnegie Mellon and the director of the Humanities Center. David has authored and edited several books and articles on American culture, in particular American film and American rock and roll. And he has been an indefatigable proponent of the humanities both here at CMU and more widely in Pittsburgh. A few years ago, David started the Pittsburgh Humanities Festival, a three-day event involving a wide array of speakers and topics held in downtown Pittsburgh and supported by the Humanities Center as well as the Pittsburgh Cultural Trust. The Humanities Festival is a great success and will again take place in the spring of 2018 and hopefully every year hence. Kathy Newman, an associate professor of CMU's English department as well, studies and writes on the relationship between the masses and mass culture. She studies the relationship between the media, TV, film, the internet, etc., and the social political world that reflects and creates. She is a political activist and a woman with a courageous sense of humor. 
She showed up last week at the president's welcome reception dressed as Karl Marx. I recognized her instantly, but I think there were a large number of uncomfortable and bewildered people in the big tent on the CFA lawn last week. Great stuff, Kathy. <laughs> so please welcome David and Kathy, who will kick off the year on Marx at 200 with their lecture, Why Marx Now, 200 Years Later. Thank you so much, uh, Dean Shinas. I did come to the dean two or three years ago, and I said, I really want to do this, but I need your back in case I end up on Fox News or worse. And he said, you have it. And that means so much to me and I think all of us. Um, so Callie is going to um, be my slide aficionado here. You just use the arrows. And I'm just going to quickly run through the events of the year, and then I will do my talk. So if you could get us going. Um, this is a thank you uh, to the behind the scenes people, including Callie himself. And next, uh, we have uh, October 19th, a panel with two CMU alum and two CMU professors talking about robotics, Uber, driverless cars, what that means for Pittsburgh, and how we plan for uh, 2040 when supposedly 70% of the jobs being done by humans will be done by robots. So next, uh, Jim Livingston and Kathy Weeks that same night will be talking from their books, No More Work and The Problem with Work. Um, these are two recognized uh, international experts on this problem. They both support universal basic income uh, and, and really want us to move away from the Protestant work ethic. Uh, but they have some differences in how they see the future uh, playing out and what they want for us. Next. Uh, Jennifer Epps Addison runs uh, the Center for Popular Democracy. She's a grassroots activist who's brought together labor and Black Lives Matter. And this is going to be kind of a toolkit kind of talk where we're really going to learn how she has made social change and her recommendations for how we can organize on the ground ourselves. Uh, next, we have uh, two best-selling biographers of Marx. I wouldn't think that a biography of Marx would be a best-selling book, but it was twice, once in 2011, once in 2013. They'll be on stage together, again, talking about the ways they see Marx similarly and differently. In January, uh, we're going to have a panel with Paul Ice, Marion Aguiar, Susan uh, Andrade from Pitt on Marx in the Global South. And in February, uh, Wendy Goldman is going to be chairing a panel on uh, we're calling Utopian Smorgasbord, where in the world uh, is Marx today. In March, we're going to have Holly Lewis talking about the politics of everybody, uh, feminism, queer theory, and Marxism at the intersection. In uh, April, we're going to have Jody Dean, who uh, wrote a fantastic new introduction to the Communist Manifesto and is really trying to get us to take communism seriously. We're going to have two artist talks in April related to uh, the art show that will be forthcoming. This is Dred Scott, uh, who's been uh, a really powerful and controversial uh, black artist working the last 10 years. And then Claire Fontaine, an artist duo uh, that does a lot of uh, explicitly revolutionary art, but they have some really interesting arguments about how they intersect with capitalism. The art show, Happy Birthday, Carl, Art, Labor, and the Future of Capitalism will run from the end of May to, through June. This is Nina Chanel Abney, an African-American artist who's painting the boardroom, will be on a giant billboard downtown. Uh, Natalia Slinko created, uh, recreated Marx's beard out of steel wool. Um, next, uh, uh, Kilanji Kiahenda is an Angolan artist who did this a triptych of uh, the ship, the Karl Marx, that was donated from the USSR to Angola uh, in the 60s. Steve Lambert, capitalism works for me, exclamation point. You get to vote. This will be on the CMU campus, uh, hopefully starting mid-April. Mid uh, Diana Quinones is a Cuban artist who took her volume of capital and punched holes in it and saved the hole punches. Uh, it might be very difficult to get this work from Cuba, but we're in the process of trying to do that right now. And Claire Fontaine again, uh, this is being recreated in a Brooklyn neon studio. 
Pedro Reyes is a Mexican artist who created a puppet called Baby Marks around uh, the time of Occupy Wall Street. He has a new play called Manufacturing Mischief that's going to star the puppets Karl Marx, Noam Chomsky, Elon Musk, and Ayn Rand. <clears throat> Uh, we're going to end the year with a one-day symposium with invited scholars um, on May 30th. And then finally, uh, we'll hopefully be having the Cultural Studies Association annual conference here um, May 31st through June 2nd. Um, Callie, a little bit before, was passing out a flyer that has all of these events. Uh, we do have a couple confirmed speakers for the Humanities Center as well. I'm remembering Laura Kipnis. Humanities Festival, Laura Kipnis is confirmed, and Anthony DeCurtis, uh, who's written about Lou Reed. Um, okay, and so I'm going to have to pop up a different PowerPoint now for the talk. <clears throat> Oops. My escape button is not working. Um, that's sort of a metaphor for our time, I think. <laughs> There we go. <clears throat> okay. Okay. All right. So, is this the revolution you are looking for? So, the first slide, please. In 2016, the Chinese sculptor Wang Yuang created a 20 foot sculpture based on his interpretation of Marx's Capital. Yu Yang grew up reading Capital along with millions of his schoolmates. He explains that different chapters were taught in primary, elementary, and high school, and it's the topic of exams. The book was with my generation all the time when we were growing up. Yu Yang started by converting capital to codes of zeros and ones, and then, quote, the software 3DS Max transfers the converted code to a three-dimensional model. Yu Yang calls this a direct and objective translation of the literature. The final result is this identity made of brass, copper, iron, fiberglass, concrete, marble, and steel. Identity looks to me a bit like a postmodern totem pole or a miniature theme park with multiple tiers in cedar, burgundy, purple, bone, brown, green, copper, silver, gold, and teal. There's a silver lavender, if you can give me the next slide, there's this kind of metallic landscape on top of this colored sculpture that reminds me of the futuristic cities in Star Wars. Many of the layers seem to have a similar twisting and drooping shape as if a collection of giant CDs was melted over the trunk of a metallic tree. I believe I see something related to the structure of capital in this sculpture, something as Byzantine, complicated, rough, and gnarled as capital itself. The layers bring to mind Marx's organization of the work into multiple chapters, subchapters, and the repeating shapes of, and colors remind me of the phrases, arguments, and ideas that are repeated, albeit in a slightly different way, throughout the work. Compare this for a moment to another Yu Yang uh, 3D sculpture, 3D printed sculpture, in which he took the first two pages of the book of Genesis in the Bible and performed a similar operation. This to me looks much more fluid, soothing, and organic, a misshapen sphere, an apple, or a human heart. When I came across Yu Yang's statue, I was intrigued that he saw, to fit to, to, so he saw fit to think of Marx's capital as a collection of data. As I continued my search, I was looking for artists at this point, I found that Yu Yang was in good company. As artists, writers, and thinkers, and purveyors of t-shirts, mugs, and piggy banks have all been using and capitalizing on Marx's image and ideas. Immediately after the global financial collapse in October of 2008, um, the, the Guardian reported that the German publisher Karl Dietz was seeing a spike in demand for Marx's work. This is Jorn Schutrumpf, who said, Marx is in fashion again. We're seeing a very distinct increase in demand for his books, a demand which we expect to rise even more steeply before the year's end. A few months prior to the collapse, David Harvey, who had been teaching and lecturing about capital for more than 40 years, decided to have his lectures on capital videotaped. During these lectures, Harvey often refers to the growing instability of large banks, using Marx to see around the corner towards the collapse to come. These lectures were adapted into a print companion, and for many faculty and students alike, the lectures in the print volume combined have become an indispensable guide. 
In 2012, The Guardian reported again on Marx's growing influence and popularity across Western Europe, noting the continued rise in book sales, the growing number of young people involved <clears throat> in the annual conference of the Socialist Workers' Party, the rise in popular and academic publications about Marx, and the incredibly ironic fact that a bank in Germany issued a credit card with Marx's image. So the Guardian argued that Marx's, pop Marx's popularity in East German was rooted in nostalgia for socialism. A 2008 survey found 52% of East Germans believed the free market was unsuitable and 43% said they wanted socialism back. As for academic publications dealing with, with Marx, The Guardian mentioned the Terry Eagleton's 2011 book, Why Marx Was Right, and Alan Bedju's little red book, The Communist Hypothesis. In 2011, a year in which the global financial crisis morphed into the Occupy movement, Mary Gabriel published Love and Capital. Gabriel's genius was to show Marx's family life, his marriage, and his role as a parent as full as his intellectual life. Love and Capital was one of the most well-reviewed books of its kind for the year and was a finalist for the National Book Award, the Pulitzer, and the National Book Critics Circle. Love and Capital is currently being adapted into a mini-series by a New York production company, uh, and this is the woman who's been hired to write it. Two years later, there came another best-selling biography, <clears throat> Jonathan Sperber's Karl Marx in 19th Century Life. Sperber argued that the view of Marx as a contemporary whose ideas are shaping the modern world has run its course. But I'm not sure that Sperber would have ended up on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart uh, if Marx was not relevant to our present moment. Another popular book to show Marx's growing influence was Thomas Piketty's Capital in the 21st Century, another massive, uh, both in weight and in popularity, bestseller. This, um, Piketty denied that he'd ever read Marx's Capital, but said economists today would do well to take inspiration from Marx's example. When I tweeted out before this lecture that Marx was making a comeback, a friend responded with the LL Cool J lyrics, don't call it a comeback. Uh, and indeed, for the last 50 years, Marx has been a central figure in the humanities. Marx, according to uh, a study in a certain citation metric um, developed by a group of scholars at the University of Indiana, is the single most frequently cited scholar in the humanities by a factor of 22. At the same time, over the last 10 years, Marx has become steadily more popular across the globe, and I'll try to speculate here about why that might be. The global financial collapse of 2008 made Marx's critique of capitalism look fresher than ever. Marx predicted cycles of collapse and consolidation, and his analysis explains how inequality deepens during times of capitalist crisis. His predictions have played out as we have seen the top 0.1% profit from the housing collapse of 2008 while the rest of us have suffered. This was recently published in the New York Times and that red line is what the, what the very top percentile has been doing and that pink line is the rest of us. Um, I also would argue that the collapse of communist regimes from the USSR to what feels a bit like a capitalist makeover of China to the opening of Cuba has everyone proclaiming the death of communism. Ironically, if communism is seen as less of a threat, then Karl Marx, as the official godfather of communism, might be seen as less threatening as well. But finally, and I would say this is another ironic twist, the post-Cold War generation, many of whom are in this room right now, uh, views socialism and communism more favorably than during any time since the 1940s. This scholar at Tufts University has hypothesized that millennials are more skeptical of capitalism than their parents, in part because they graduated into the worst job, job market since the Great Depression. Millennials also see Scandinavian countries as models for democratic socialism rather than current or former communist countries like Russia or China. Whatever the reasons, Marx's comeback coincides with several upcoming anniversaries. Today, is the, is the 150th anniversary of the publication of Das Kapital. And on May 5th, 2018, Karl Marx will be 200 years old. 
This year and next, there are tributes and celebrations for both Capital and its author ac across the globe. York University held a celebration of 150 years of Capital in May. Trier, where Marx was born, is planning an entire year of events, as is the Marx Memorial Library. This Berlin-based website, Marx 200, is keeping a running tally of these events and adding to them daily. Our commemoration, Marx at 200, is currently one of the only US year-long programs devoted to Marx and his favorite themes. In late April of 2018, we'll be presenting an exhibit of international artists. It was originally inspired by the show in Trier uh, in 2013, Icone Karl Marx, Karl Marx as an icon. The exhibit featured 130 years of Marx iconography, stamps, flags, posters, busts, uh, almost every kind of media you can imagine. In the Trier exhibit, the images that really captured my imagination were the more recent pieces. These included Claire Fontaine's Untitled 2004, Jonathan Meese's Erzmarks, Werner Horvath's Subdued Pop Portrait of Marx, and Otmar Horl's 500 waist-high Marx statues that were distributed all over Trier as part of the exhibit. Using the catalog of this exhibit as a starting point, I began to scour the globe for more artists who were using Marx's image. I have found dozens, but today I will only present a few who use Marx's capital in particular. I will start with Karl Marx, Frederick Engels' collected works, Brickbats, by Claire Fontaine. The book covers are printed digitally and are glued around individual bricks. There are 50 in all. Uh, Claire Fontaine took her name from the famous French stationery company. Claire Fontaine's assistants, the founding artists, are Fulvia Carnavale, originally from Italy, and James Thornhill, who's originally from the UK. Claire Fontaine has used this technique for a variety of serially published books since the mid-2000s. The process is part of what interests Claire Fontaine the most. In an interview with Bomber magazine, she explained some of her thinking behind these pieces. Since the books have been transformed into solid objects that have the same weight and thickness, they have all become equivalent, just as they are for the inexperienced reader and within the logic of the market. Folio books all have a reproduction of a modern artwork on their cover, and we were intrigued by the lack of connection between the titles and the images that accompany them. By associating the covers of these chosen, petrified books, we obtained a puzzle of visual and verbal elements, a sort of story. At the same time, the sculpture insists on the problem of illegi illegibility. It looks like a tomb for these books." Unquote. This piece points to the irony that, of course, under capitalism, the collected works of Marx and Engels are commodities like anything else. We can see that in the glee with which The Guardian reported on Marx's book sales. And indeed, the market for cultural commodities has become so segmented that hundreds of items bearing Marx's name can be found uh, online in listicles, like the one in which I found one of my favorite birthday presents ever, a piggy bank in the shape of Marx's head. There is also such a thing as communist Etsy. But Claire Fontaine isn't focused on the market as the source of our woes. Quote, there is no such thing as defined outside of capitalism anymore. The idea of working against capitalism was born from the utopia that a different kind of economy could exist run by different laws where the power wouldn't produce oppression and repression, unquote. Claire Fontaine is interested in revolution, but she doesn't see a straight line between the work of the artist and the coming change. Claire Fontaine understands that, quote, making art can't oppose or rebel or subvert the political condition of late capitalism. Instead, she hopes for art to create a hole in the landscape through which a revolution might creep. These brick bats, brick books, Claire Fontaine explains, contain within them that a reminder that these fossilized books could become weapons again. Let me take you to another piece that engages with bricks and capital. In this piece, the Mexican artist Jorge Mendez Blake makes capital the cornerstone of his brick wall. According to his artist statement, he refers to these works as ruins, and there's something ancient, old, or dead about these bricks and books combined. 
I wonder if Blake's work is slightly more hopeful or simply more didactic. A single book, a single work has the power to weaken, to disrupt, to change the world. In some ways, however, Blake's vision might be closer to that of Claire Fontaine's. He sees the book as the place where form and content meet. Quote, the design of the book corresponds to its page count, fonts, and materials, but none of its exterior qualities can reflect the content properly. So the book is like an intermediary between the content and the world. We see this external information of the book object combined with the physical particularities of a space. The contents of the book also begin to change. Both Blake and Claire Fontaine abstract the notion of use value and exchange value that we usually associate with a book, especially a book as revolutionary as Capital. I'm going to end with two pieces that are a bit more playful. The first is the work of Christine Lahr, a German artist based in Berlin. A few months after the financial collapse in May of 2009, Lahr began the making of Capital. Every day she transfers one cent to the German Federal Ministry of Finance from her own account. In the reason for payment field, she writes out 108 characters from Marx's capital. The complete transfer of the more than 1.5 million characters will take another 46 years. Lahr calls this project a donation to the entire people, entered into the state budget. She takes a screenshot of each transfer, signs it, and gives it away. She also takes a master copy of Capital and crosses out the character she's transferred for that day. With this project, she hopes to degrade bureaucratism with a gesture of giving. Her micro -dona donation, she argues, upstates, upsets the state's balance sheet. Ironically, or perhaps it is the point, her donation will compound and eventually pay off Germany's national debt in 300 years. <laughs> I find Lars' master copy to be the most hauntingly beautiful aspect of the piece. It reminds me a bit of Wang Yuang's process turning capital into zeros and ones, an ancient pamphlet set, a new script made of tiny, nearly identical marks. The project eludes large format display with the bank transfer forms looking much like all forms, immigration forms, credit card applications, square pre-made boxes that we fill with the official marks of our national identity identities and our monetary worth. When Lar exhibited this work, she played the role of the capital manager, the proverbial man behind the desk. The last project I will share with you is Stephanie Sajuko's Excess Capital. Here is Sajuko's description of her project. Quote, I regularly search eBay for copies of this title that are up for auction. I place just one bid. If I am outbid, I don't win. If I win, I am forced to buy it. This works to create an automatic demand for the books and gives me a chance to accumulate used capital. <laughs> I, I do not use the buy it now feature, she explains, because that is responding to the seller's value system and not the market's evaluation of the item. As with each of these capital projects, Sajuko brings attention to our assumptions about the value of books and this book in particular. This piece has a sense of humor in her, her explanation that she does this to accumulate capital when, like Lar, she may be giving more than she gets. And like the other projects, Saijuko complicates the idea of sameness and difference when considering different editions, styles, hard, soft, worn, torn of the same title. She writes, the books vary by being published at different times in different formats, creating variety within sameness. Whereas Claire Fontaine showed sameness within difference, Sajuko brings us difference within sameness. Like Claire Fontaine, Sajuko is frequently in di dialogue with contemporary capitalism in a few of her other projects, Market Forces uh, and the Counterfeit Crochet Project. One possible reason for this uptick in the art of capital is that academics and artists are increasingly overlapping in our output and in our training. MFA programs are increasingly requiring that their faculty obtain PhDs. And as the market for university jobs has imploded, errant graduate students might have as good a chance of becoming a starving artist as they might trying to find a place on the tenure track. Moreover, the maker economy is pushing all of us to be designers of our websites, our resumes, our syllabi, and our intellectual lives. 
As a material cultural historian, however, I'm inclined to believe that the global financial collapse has artists turning, as so many of us have, back to Marx and capital. They are turning to Marx, I would argue, not so much for utopian inspiration or for a primer on how to create a communist state, but they're seeking to understand all the ways in which capitalism is failing ordinary people. They are bringing us a Marx whose contemporary value is an explanation and critique. At the same time, these artists allow us to look sideways or cross-eyed, to look at things without directly looking at them, like looking through the glasses we used last month to watch the eclipse. These works might create a hole in the landscape that could quite possibly become a place through which the resistance might creep. These works of art just might be the revolution we've been looking for. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Um, this will be less entertaining. Um, um, and my, my, my title of this part of the talk is a, a kind of shift from the advertised, it's how Marx now. Um, in his essay, What is an Author? Michel Foucault describes Freud and Marx as initiators of discursive practices and distinguishes them from literary authors, from the founders of disciplines, and from the authorities of ancient and medieval times, such as Socrates or Thomas Aquinas. Quote, Freud is not simply the author of the interpretation of dreams or wit and its relation to the unconscious, and Marx is not simply the author of the Communist Manifesto or Capital. They both establish the endless possibility of discourse unquote. Foucault continues, quote, there are no false statements in the work of these initiators. Those statements considered inessential or prehistoric in that they are associated with another discourse are simply neglected in favor of the more pertinent aspects of the work. The initiation of a discursive practice, unlike the founding of a science, overshadows and is necessarily detached from its later developments and transformations. As a consequence, we define the theoretical validity of a statement with respect to the work of the initiator, unquote. Foucault observes that one can always return to Freud or Marx for fresh insights or interpretations. Quote, a study of Galileo's works could alter our knowledge of the history, but not the science of mechanics, whereas a re-examination of the books of Freud or Marx can transform our understanding of psychoanalysis or Marxism, unquote. I've quoted Foucault at some length here because his account lays out the difficulty of reading Marx apart from Marxism, which is my task here today. It is true that Marx himself seemed to authorize such a reading when he asserted, I am not a Marxist. But the context of this well-known quote suggests that Marx was, in fact, using the statement to distinguish real Marxists from false ones. While no one is, of course, free, well, while one is, of course, free to do with a dead author anything one likes, Foucault's analysis makes it clear that readings outside the discursive practice are unlikely to command the audience who ought to be most interested in critical reinterpretations of Marx's work. Moreover, one cannot dismiss the historical reality of the discursive practice, which has had an enormous impact for good and ill. Still, it would be better for Marx if we could debate and acknowledge his errors, improve upon his insights, and affirm his discoveries on their merits. My argument today is twofold. On the one hand, I want to argue that Marx is best understood as a liberal and not as an opponent of liberalism. This is meant as a reinterpretation of Marx's own thought. On the other hand, I want to argue that historically, Marx had a significant impact on, the political, on a political practice that is seldom recognized, which is that his ideas are the basis for the many changes in liberal democracies associated with the welfare state. 
These changes stem not from Marxism directly, since it usually opposed social democratic reforms, but from the translation of Marx and Marxian ideas into new political practices and programs. I am acutely aware that these claims will be seen to diminish Marx's radicalism, and as I will explain, that is in one sense my goal. However, that Marx's influence has helped produce the social democracy of the 20th century does not preclude the possibility that, we, that it will also one day contribute to the more egalitarian socialism he called communism. I will begin the first argument with a quotation from the Communist Manifesto. In place of the old bourgeois society with its classes and class antagonisms, we shall have an association in which the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all." Unquote. Notice that Marx and Engels' description of the society they seek to bring about focuses on individual development and freedom. Historian James Livingston, the same Jim Livingston who will be here next month, um, compares this statement to Abraham Lincoln's assertion, quote, as I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. This expresses my idea of democracy, unquote. Livingston notes the Hegelian resonance of Lincoln's statement, recalling the German philosopher's master-slave dialectic. But he says of the passage from the manifesto, quote, Marx and Engels are even more insistent, I think, on the significance of individualism, self-determination, self-mastery in their grand scheme of revolutionary change. Notice that the free development of each is the condition of the free development of all. <coughs> Even for these communists, it's not an either or choice between individuality and community, between liberty and equality. They go together. They require each other, unquote. It has been observed that Marx does not anywhere talk about justice, a concept we typically associate with equality and with revolution. Equality is just, and revolution represents just desserts for those who have treated others unjustly. But this is not Marx's conception. In Capital, Marx compares the bourgeois revolution to the one he hopes, to come, hopes will come next. Quote, the transformation of scattered private property arising from individual labor into capitalist property is naturally a process incomparably more protracted, violent, and difficult than the transformation of capitalistic private property already practically resting on socialized production into socialized property. In the former case, we had the expropriation of the mass of the people by a few usurpers. In the latter case, we have the expropriation of a few usurpers by the mass of the people. Notice that Marx does not call for the punishment of the usurpers. He merely wants the means of production that they now own to be owned by all. Rather than justice, what motivates Marx is freedom. Like Hegel, Marx sees freedom as the telos of history. Human progress means wresting freedom from necessity. In the manifesto, Marx and Engels praise the bourgeoisie for the freedom they have brought with them. Quote, the bourgeoisie historically has played a most revolutionary part. The bourgeoisie, whether it has got the up, wherever it has got the upper hand, has put an end to all feudal, patriarchal, idyllic relations. It has piteously torn asunder the motley feudal ties that bound man to his natural superiors. The bourgeoisie cannot exist without constantly revolutionizing the instruments of production and thereby the relations of production, and with them, the whole relations of society. All fixed, fast, frozen relations, with their train of ancient and venerable prejudices and opinions, are swept away. All new formed ones become antiquated before they can ossify. All that is solid melts into air. All that is holy is profaned. And man is at last faced, compelled to face with sober senses his real conditions of life, and his relations with his kind." Unquote. If we do not recognize Marx and Engels' admiration for the bourgeoisie expressed in these lines, it may be because we are not as liberal as they are. 
We desire stability, a check on freedom, typical of pre-capitalist modes of production. We may look askance at the profaning of the holy, even if we don't profess a religion. Marx attributes a radical freedom here to bourgeois society, and he perhaps overestimates it. That, but that overestimate is itself evidence of the importance of freedom to Marx and Engels. But what about, you ask, the dictatorship of the proletariat? Here's what Marx and Engels say. Quote, the first step is to raise the proletariat to the position of ruling class, to win the battle of democracy. The proletariat will use its political supremacy to wrest, by degrees, all capital from the bourgeoisie. Unquote. The dictatorship of the proletariat must be understood in parallel with Marx and Engels' description of the current situation, their current situation, as a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. Quote, the executive, of the, the executive of the modern state is but a committee for managing the common affairs of the whole bourgeoisie, unquote. The revolution will bring about an increase in freedom for everyone, even the bourgeoisie, except in one area, free competition. Quote, no category of the bourgeois economy, not even the first one, the determination of value, can become real by means of free competition. Hence, the absurdity of considering free competition as being the final development of human liberty and the negation of free competition as being the negation of individual liberty and of social production founded on individual liberty. It is only free development on a limited foundation, that of the dominion of capital." Unquote. Marx imagines that the dictatorship of the proletariat will be more liberal than the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. In order to further make the case for Marx's liberalism, but also to begin the shift to my second argument, that Marx deserves to be called a founder of social democracy, we need a bit of a history lesson. What were the societies of advanced industrial nations like in the mid-19th century? Well, one fact seems very important. Marx had to leave both Germany and France to avoid persecution for his political views. Germany was not in any sense a liberal democracy, and Marx describes it as a place where the bourgeoisie were still in the process of coming to power. France was ruled throughout most of the 19th century by kings and emperors. England and the United States were more tolerant of dissenting political views, but in neither country was there the broad freedom of political expression that we more or less take for granted today. For example, in the United States, abol abolitionist views could not be expressed in the southern states. Later in the 19th century, socialists, anarchists, and trade unionists were routinely jailed. And during World War I, thousands of opponents of the war were imprisoned or deported. Liberal democracy was not, in fact, that liberal. Um, if we turn from what are sometimes called negative freedoms, the sort reflected in the Bill of Rights, to the positive freedoms of the sort that Franklin Roosevelt proposed in his second Bill of Rights, rights to employment, housing, medical care, and education, we find that not only did bourgeois societies not hold these things to be rights, but also that the governments of these societies did almost nothing to answer these needs. While Germany had fairly robust public education in the 19th century, in the US in 1840, just over half of school-aged children attended school, and probably a majority of these were in private academies. The availability of public education varied by state, with it being virtually non-existent in the South prior to the Civil War. In the North, free public education was available in most states, but only for some of the elementary grades. Education, however, was virtually the only positive right that was at all recognized in, 19th century, in the 19th century in any bourgeois society. By the 1950s, however, France, Germany, the UK, and the US have all become welfare states in which the government takes some degree of responsibility for the economic well-being of its citizens. How did this change come about, and in what ways were Marx's ideas influential? 
One answer is certainly that the fear of communist revolution pushed the bourgeoisie to cede some economic authority to the public. The Russian Revolution of 1917 did not immediately have this kind of impact, but in the midst of the Great Depression of the 1930s, communist parties in the West began to seem more attractive. Thus, fear of the extreme left led elements of the bourgeoisie to be willing to accept the proposals of a more moderate left. It would be a mistake, however, to think of Marx's influence on social democracy as being primarily of this negative kind. In order to understand this, we need to keep in mind that by the late 19th century, Marx had become the most influential socialist thinker. Marx, of course, did not invent either socialism or communism. And as David McClellan says of the manifesto, quote, none of the ideas were new. He means both that Marx had previously articulated many of them and that he borrowed others from French socialists and even bourgeois French historians. But the powerful articulation of the manifesto and later more academic, the more academic working out of the position in capital made Marx the preeminent socialist voice. Not everyone who heard this voice became a Marxist, though Marx's well-known assertion around 1880, I am not a Marxist, was actually meant to distinguish himself from others who held views that were attributed to him, but which he wished to eschew. In the specific context, Marx opposed part of the French Workers' Party program that demanded shorter hours and better working conditions because he believed that would lessen the likelihood of revolution. The fact that others involved in producing this program saw these demands as Marxist demonstrates Marx's influence despite his disagreement. Workers and socialist parties of the late 19th century are the place where demands for limits on capitalism first began to be widely significant. While it would take another half century or so for many of these demands to result in legislation, we can trace the process back to a movement that coalesced around Marx's ideas. I'm arguing that a direct line can be drawn from these early socialist parties to social security, unemployment insurance, public housing, and other elements of the New Deal in the US, and, the even, and even more strongly to the more robust welfare states of Europe. I make this argument in full knowledge that it would not make Marx happy. Marx staunchly opposed socialist parties who advocated directly the kind of state that emerged in the West in the latter half of the 20th century. He would have classified the outcome as bourgeois socialism at best. Marx believed that the proletariat would become capable of a revolution that would bring it to power and enable the emergence of communism. While he did not always oppose measures that might help the workers in the short term, his decision was always related to how the measure might affect the possibility of revolution. The argument that I'm making, a hypothesis really, um, is a historical one. So it need not necessarily have any relation to Marxism as a discursive practice. But as I said at the outset, I believe it would be better for Marx, that is for the long-term influence of Marx's thought, if we understood it apart from the discursive practice. For one thing, it is patently clear that Marx got some things wrong. And there are many as other aspects of his thought that are best approached critically. We need to recognize that Marx made mistakes and that his work, like that of any other thinker, represents a combination of insight and misprision. Let me then take up what I think of as Marx's central mistake, his idea of revolution. Given the references to it throughout Marx's work, the French Revolution seems to be the model for his vision of the communist revolution. The French Revolution was a much more, um, was a, was a much more radical attempt to remake a society than any other until the Russian Revolution, and maybe more radical even than that. Um, it not only lopped off the heads of the aristocracy, but also attempted to impose a new way of life on the nation, one consistent with revolutionary, the revolutionary's ideals. What Marx seems to forget, however, is that the French Revolution was in most respects a failure. The revolution and the revolutionary gov government lasted only 10 years, 
ending in Napoleon's coup of 1799. The Republican ideals of the revolution uh, would be honored mainly in the breach over the next century. While it is true that the bourgeoisie were more powerful after the revolution, they were already economically dominant when the revolution began. Marx seems to think that the proletariat will be able to seize power in an event like the French Revolution, albeit one that is less violent, but he doesn't acknowledge the difference between the slow emergence of capitalism, which his work discusses rather fully, and the rapid imposition of socialism. As I have argued elsewhere, if we take the rise of capitalism as the historical model, quote, Socialism can only come about by the creation of socialist institutions, the slow process of creating new economic and social life. The point is clear. For a socialist revolution to occur, socialism must already exist. And, and that's the end of me quoting myself. <laughs> this critique of Marx's concept of revolution gives us a way of recouping his influence on the development of social democracy in the hope of a better future. I do not mean to deny the bleakness of the present moment. The corporation has become massively oppressive in its economic and political dominance, and I do not see that, it is, that its end is near. Neoliberalism has, especially in the US and the UK, undone some of the social democratic reforms Marx's influence helped to bring about. Economic inequality is greater now than it has been at any time since these social democratic policies were put in place. But there are several silver linings to this cloud. First, we need to recognize that the social institutions created under capitalism can be steps towards socialism. They are instances of cooperation and social solidarity, and they represent a genuinely progressive transformation of the Hobbesian world of 19th century capitalism. Secondly, recognizing that genuine social progress has occurred despite, and indeed because of capitalism, remember Marx's praise of the bourgeoisie, we should be able to see that the old opposition of reform and revolution is a false one. Revolution can only be the culmination of a long history of reform. Such recognition should inform the political practice of the left, which should insist on its vision of a radically egalitarian and free society, but not expect it to be achieved in one fell swoop. Thank you. We have some time for questions before I hope many of you will be able to join us at the reception in the Conan Room, a German food catered from Hofbrau House, and then uh, the young Karl Marx, Raoul Peck's uh, latest film uh, will start at 6.45. But we have time for discussion now. Oh, in the back. Criticizing this model, the model of revolution adopted from the French Revolution, um, are there not other models of revolution that Marx is kind of in, in, involved in thinking through, namely like the Industrial Revolution and the Scientific Revolution, which have you know, this similar kind of dynamic of being characterized as evolving over a, an extended period of time of being kind of continuously incomplete, but also like moving in leaps at various points. Well, clearly, Marx is very interested in what we call the Industrial Revolution. It's everywhere in his writing. Though I'm not aware of him ever using that phrase. I, I could be wrong. I haven't obviously not read all of those complete works. Um, so when Marx talks about revolution, he almost always refers to two examples. The other one is um, England and Cromwell. And so what's characteristic of both of those is that the, the head of state is de deposed, um, and a new form of government is imposed on, on society, and what Marx never talks about in each case is that both revolutions are very short-lived and the old system comes back in in some form very quickly. Um, and it's curious that Marx doesn't 
doesn't talk about that. And so there is this, there is this odd disconnect, it seems to me, in Marx's writing between his very strong consciousness of the incredible complexity and long preparation for the economic changes that he's dealing with, and his idea that political change seems to happen almost overnight, that it, it's the political changes are not, do not happen at the same scale. Is there a woman we could call on next? Is a question? I like to go back and forth. Yes, thank you. Could you stand up? Oh, sorry. So, you say about the proletariat should start the revolution. Like, since that's just such a large group of people, like, how exactly would it be possible to, like, I guess, like, I mean, like, the wants of a group of people is obviously much harder to, like, implement than just one single person. And so, how will that work, I guess? I <laughs> well, so, Mar Mar what Marx believed was that. <laughs> Because of the trends he saw in the 19th century, the proletariat would m include more and more of the population. And eventually, basically, you would have a very small bourgeoisie. And virtually everyone else would, would be wage laborers who would be immiserated. And with that radical division, with so many people being um, excluded, basically, from most wealth, he believed that those conditions would uh, be fertile ground for, for revolution. Moreover, he believed he was participating in a movement whereby the proletariat would begin to think of itself as a revolutionary agent. He believed that the bourgeoisie were an organized class. They weren't just a, an analytic division. They were a group of people who worked for each other's interests. They, they, they had a project. And he saw the proletariat as beginning to, at, at his moment, evolve that kind of project so that they would, they would be in a position then to think of themselves as a collective agent. Um, now, it's, it's almost, uh, I think we could say pretty definitively that Marx's prediction about what would happen to uh, people outside of the, of the the two poles, the bourgeoisie and the industrial proletariat, was wrong. That in fact, capitalism evolved the continued existence of intermediate economic groups. Um, the petty bourgeoisie don't disappear. Small business owners continue to be significant in all capitalist countries for a long time. It's possible that today we are seeing their, their disappearance, but they have been important up until now. Um, in the beginning of the 20th century, the professional managerial class evolves in, in major uh, industrial countries. And Marx had no notion that a new group like that would appear. So that prediction about the proletariat becoming the vast majority turned out to be wrong. So far. So Right, so far. That's right. Still might be right. Chris? So my question is actually about sort of the, the politics of commemoration, right? So this is, um, in a sense, about you know, what it means to celebrate Marx at, at 200 years, but also to recognize that Marx in the 1840s was living at the 200-year anniversary of the English Revolution, right? So, so in a sense, um, and he was, he was quite aware of that as well. So, so I guess I'm sort of wondering whether there was something about that commemoration in the uh, 1840s that, that was sort of central to the sort of the moment of Marx, and whether anything like that is still possible today, 200 years later, or whether something is so different now that that kind of commemorative practice and the politics that generate it um, you know, is, is somehow different or impossible. I don't know as much about the first part of your question. I, I mean, I'm hopeful, I guess, that this commemorating fever that seems to be uh, sort of uh, global, uh, that it's connected to real genuine interest in Marx's thoughts and ideas and real social movements uh, that are sort of bubbling up despite uh, neoliberalism and, and other uh, unfortunate recent events. Um, so I, I don't know. I'm hopeful. Um, I, 
Paul Ice, early on, kind of urged us away from hagiography in this year. And so the way I've been trying to think about it is what were Marx's important themes and who's talking about those themes today and how can we bring them here and have them help us have this conversation um, rather than something that's uh, celebratory in a straightforward and kind of worshipful way. Could I just ask, was there a celebration of the revolution in England in 1840? <laughs> I doubt it. You know, so Marx's um, Communist Manifesto in English, its first uh, version, it was, in a, it was in a publication called The Red Republican. You know, and the, and the Red Republican is very self-consciously, uh, you know, in this sort of 16, 1640s tradition of republicanism. Um, so, you know, it's, it's bound up with sort of English chartism in the uh, 19th century. Um, so I don't know if there was a celebration, but if, if you read the, the sort of radical press, you, you do see quite a bit of awareness of, of that uh, anniversary. Can I have a moment? Actually, this is just a quick follow-up to, to Chris's question. It's a comment, but I think it is kind of important to think about what kinds of uh, masters and mistresses commemoration serves. Uh, and Kathy, you're, you're connecting the commemoration to art, which Got my heart there, <laughs> you know, and I think that that is a question I think to think about. We're celebrating Marx's birthday. Shakespeare's birthday was about nationalism uh, two hundred years ago. What is this about? So Internationalism. <laughs> Together, it seems to me they're about consumption and representation of Marx. Like, how do we consume? How is he represented? And in what forms do we represent and consume him at this, you know, 150 years of capitalism today, and then of course next year, 200 years of his birthday? And I'm wondering, for both of your talks, if you can give a bit more context for the arguments that you're making. So, for example. Why is it important enough for us to think about how Marx is represented in art? And why, what are you responding to in representing Marx as more liberal than liberal for our current kind of political conjecture? I mean, I think this project started for me um, as a response to pop culture representations. Uh, that's, that's what I think about all the time. Um, I found a company in Japan called Mountain Research created a set of action figures, and it's Marx, Mao, Lenin, and Thoreau. Um, and they go camping, their, their legs pull off so they can go in a canoe, and their hands are made like this because they're always reading. And I just was like, what kind of a world do we live in where something like this could be produced and sold? Um, and so that was, that was one of the questions that led to this whole project. Um, and so, you know, I'm seeing Marx as a kind of a pop icon, partly because of the digital era. Um, but I'm also guessing that there's some political utopianism behind some of these representations uh, that might not even be self-conscious on the, the part of the promoters. Uh, in the DIY world, there's uh, quite a few Lego Marx figures that have been made. Um, there's, a, there's a Marx garden gnome on Etsy. I mean, just the, the, the pervasiveness and the weird forms that Marx is taking right now is the puzzle that I set out to solve. Do you see this like a desire for a utopian impulse? I think communism is denuded and Marx is safe again and maybe a little bit funnier than he was before. <laughs> um, so most people in the capitalist West blame Marx for the Soviet Union and the various uh, totalitarian experiments that followed it. Um, I want to argue that Marx is not properly to blame. Um, that Marx, of course, had nothing to do with the Russian Revolution. He was dead quite a few years before it occurred. 
he wasn't even around for the, um, for the founding meetings of the particular version of the Workers' Party that, that led to the ideas behind that. Uh, he even knows we're distant. But, um, so, um, so the use that, that the Soviets made of Marx, and especially that got made of him as the dictatorship progressed and moved from Lenin to Stalin, etc., um, I don't think are at all authorized by Marx's work because I think he would have been horrified. Um, and so, because I believe that Marx's critique of capitalism is extremely valuable and you know more important today than it ever was, I want to argue that to take Marx seriously doesn't mean that we have to, to say, well, the only alternative is some kind of dystopia like there used to be uh, in Russia or and maybe still is in China. Well, so my reading of Marx, in my reading of Marx, I really don't see Marx blaming the bourgeoisie as ha for having bad intentions towards anyone. For Marx, it's not a matter of these people having are being evil or, or doing nasty things. They are playing a historical role. And that historical role um, causes enormous misery, no doubt. But that historical role is also a step towards a much better world. For Marx, you can't get from feudalism to communism without going through capitalism. So it is precisely because the, the bourgeoisie are willing, in his view, to challenge everything that went before them to be the most revolutionary class in history that makes them the kind of class he wants the proletariat to be. Um, so, and I think that this is one of the failures of Marxism that it, for reasons that sometimes make political sense but which never make theoretical sense, tended to blame the bourgeoisie as individuals for the problems they cause rather than understanding that it's really only their historical role that causes them to behave in this way. Can I follow up? Um, so, um, so also the sort of liberalism that he lampoons from Adam Smith and free market liberalism, how does that line up with? And also the sort of, he does point out um, actors and people who are, I think, more, uh, maybe that's not the right word, but in terms of uh, bolstering ideology, the, type, the kind of ideology that obscures uh, the power relations and the power relationships of the bourgeoisie. I think that a lot of Marxists might disagree with that kind of over-determined over reading where the bourgeoisie are just playing a role and they have no um, understanding or control of what they're doing. I think that... I mean, I don't mean they don't understand your control, but their, their, their goal is not to make people unhappy. Their goal is not to impoverish people. Their goal is to, to increase their own wealth, to enrich themselves. Um, you could call them greedy. Marx, Marx does occasionally. Um, but historically, what's important about them is that they are a step towards the revolution. Um, and so your question about liberalism is important, be, and, and it speaks to the difficulty of that term. Um, 
especially since the rise of neoliberalism, it is very hard to distinguish um, kind of liberalism in the 19th century sense, which was associated with all kinds of freedoms from the hierarchical societies out of which modern states were emerging. Um, and this is what it, I think it's very hard in the 20th century or 21st century to keep in mind, that we take for granted the idea of all of these political freedoms, which were available to almost no societies in the world in the mid-19th century. The United States had more protection for those freedoms than anybody else, and ours were very limited. So Marx is, Marx is clearly in favor of those kinds of individual freedoms. Um, the freedom that he is not in favor of is the freedom to exploit at will. And so free trade, free competition, unregulated economic <coughs> behavior, um, he thinks need to be regulated, they need to be done away with. But that's in the name of greater personal freedom for everyone else in every other sphere. Uh, I've got time for two more questions. Um, yes. Uh, yes. Um, so following the uh, Cold War, um, people in the United States have sort of demonized the word socialism. Uh, but in 1880, Frederick Engels described the Communist Manifesto as being scientific socialism. Uh, do you think that we would benefit from relabeling socialism as scientific socialism, much the same as Bernie Sanders relabels democratic socialism? Uh, in a word, no. <laughs> um, partly because it confuses um, theory and science. In one of the great failed legacies of, of Engels and the way in which Marx, I mean, there's some stuff in Marx that authorizes this, but it's, it's really a mistake to push this, to, 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 to read Marx too much in this way. Um, the idea that Marx was laying bare the inevitable laws of social development um, just seems wrong uh, to me, and it's not sustained by um, any any kind of research that we've done since. Um, we have to deal with these kinds of arguments, not in terms of science, but in terms of conflicting ideas and opinions and interests. And there isn't a way scientifically to determine that I'm aware of. I don't know anyone who's come up with the, the science to answer these questions um, uh, about what form of government or what way of life is best for people. the whole period that you're talking about, uh, there's an enormous around the world growth in literacy and general access to information. How does that play into the uh, stories or interpretations that you offer? Is it, is it part of the story? It's, it's a huge, huge change. I have a mentor who's working on a project called Reading Capital and the importance that capital in particular played and continues to play in workers' movements and revolution. In what? In, in, in workers' movements. Like a very, there's a small pocket-sized version of capital uh, that was printed at the turn of the last century that could fit in a, a breast pocket or a pants pocket. Um, and we had a wonderful dissertation uh, written in our history department about 10 years ago on the rise of socialism and literacy together as a kind of, these kind of twin worldwide phenomena. Uh, so I think, I think you're onto something there. Um, reading may be receding <laughs> in our current moment. Um, uh, it doesn't have to be reading. I mean, literacy <coughs> sure. can be scrawled on walls and, uh, and come in through your fingers on the, but this is one of the big social changes and I don't know what to make of it. Well, until last year, I would have said that it made better citizens out of people. <laughs> <laughs> I no longer have that faith. 
So I want to thank you for your attention yeah. and invite you. Um, This year won't work without you, so I hope to see you again and again uh, throughout the year. Please bring your friends.